My father, Howard David Hines, was one of the smartest, well-spoken, generous, musically talented men I've ever met. It took the collective education and lifetimes of learning of around 12 adults to finally beat him once at Trivial Pursuit. <laughs> However, there were times that my dad lacked common sense. One of his great accomplishments, at least to me, um, in living 81 years was that, to my knowledge, my father never changed a single diaper. <laughs> it's pretty impressive considering he had two kids and 12 grandchildren. But the closest he ever came was when I was about three or four months old, the story goes. My mother had errands to run all day, and he was going to be left at home uh, taking care of Jennifer and me, and um, she put a fresh, clean diaper on me first thing in the morning and told him, Howard, you're probably going to have to change him before I get back. And when she returned that evening, I still had the same diaper on, and it was about to explode. And my mother said, why didn't you change his diaper? He said, the box says the diapers are good up to 12 pounds. <laughs> Some of you get that, and some of, yeah, my mom said, that's a 12-pound baby, Howard. <laughs> I want to share with you a little biographical information about Dad. Some of it's already been said, just a, a few things. And then the main things that he meant to me based on some of his favorite passages of Scripture that he quoted often to me. My parents met when they were about 15 years old. They were both married uh, there when they were about 20, I think, on June 1st, 1963. As was said, they were married for uh, 60 years. One of the greatest gifts my father gave me was how much he loved my mom. And every chance he got, he would tell me how, how special she was and how thankful he was for her. And he used expressions. I still don't know what they mean. She was 411 kinds of fine. Does anyone actually use that expression? My dad was very smart. He, he had a, an incredible memory. He remembered almost everything he read, I think. And he was the valedictorian of his high school class at, at Harrison High School. He got a bachelor's degree in history, a master's degree in history. He completed the coursework for um, a PhD in history at the University of Cincinnati. And the reason he never finished it uh, is speaking to you right now. He had to get a, a real job, apparently. They don't pay you to go to school forever. So he sold life insurance and annuities and things like that for four decades instead of teaching history. But he was awesome at Trivial Pursuit. The man knew everything. He did his undergraduate degree through ROTC and ended up as a captain in uh, Vietnam in 1966. Around my dad's junior year, however, at the University of Cincinnati, he lost his Christian faith and became an agnostic. And after Vietnam, from what I've been told he became a hostile ag agnostic, an angry ag agnostic. Angry at the God that he was no longer sure existed. And he identified himself as an agnostic for 15 years. And my mother told me those are the most miserable 15 years of his life. As has already been said, my dad loved music. He sang with the Cincinnati Glee Club and the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra. He told me that one of the highlights of his life was singing Beethoven's Ninth Symphony with that group. Dad taught me how to play chess when I was five years old. Uh, we would sit in the basement with the chessboard set up and listen to every kind of music imaginable. And he had an awesome stereo system with big, huge speakers. And we would sit down there and listen to the Beatles and Frederick Chopin and George Gershwin and Simon and Garfunkel, Badfinger, Beethoven, Judy Collins, Don Francisco, Dave Brubeck, The King Singers, Andrew Lloyd Webber, Fats Domino, The Flashdance soundtrack, <laughs> Stevie Wonder, and dozens of others. Needless to say, my musical tastes growing up in a public elementary school made no sense to my friends. They didn't know who, they were, who anybody was. He encouraged me to work hard at the piano, which I loved from day one when I started lessons when I was little. Dad would play his guitar and sing constantly for us at home. I often fell asleep at night listening to him play his guitar and singing those Don Francisco songs. I could still hear them in my mind. He would always say there's good and there's garbage in every kind of music. He also loved to fish. In fact, I saw today um, in his study, he has a plaque that says God made two-thirds of the earth's surface water it therefore follows that two-thirds of one's time should be spent fishing. 
He was there for every sporting event I ever participated in, soccer, basketball, football. An old high school friend texted me this past week and said, I can still hear your dad yelling, somebody get a rebound. <laughs> Shortly after football ended my senior year, dad handed me a three ring binder in which he had laminated every newspaper article, every picture, every statistic, the roster, all the programs, and in fact, um, I got my picture in the paper a few times. He got the original prints of those pictures from the newspapers and put those in that and had it all bound together nicely. And there was uh, two words in the front of it. It just said, with respect. My dear wife, Amy, and I, we talked about getting married when I was still a, a junior in college. And my parents didn't know Amy very well at all. And we'd only dated for just a few months when there was no doubt in my mind this was going to happen. And I sat down with my mom and dad and told them I wanted to marry Amy. It was a shock to my mom, but not my dad. My mom immediately launched into me, just went off. This is too fast. You didn't know her very well. What are you thinking? What's your problem? This is the only time I can remember in, in all my life, my dad leaned back in a very calm, controlled voice, said, Peggy, be quiet. <laughs> he then leaned over the table and said, Patrick, I'm so thankful you found such a great, godly Christian woman you want to marry. I want you to know you have my full support. If there's anything I can do to help you make this happen, you just let me know. To which my mother launched right into me again. <laughs> and Dad did the same thing. He leaned back and said, I said to be quiet. And he looks back at me and says, son, you're the man. You just let me know what you need so I can help you make this happen. And it wasn't until then that I knew how well my dad really knew me. As much as I know, Mom, no son's ever had a better mother. My father knew what I needed in that moment. I needed a dad that believed in me. He was rough around the edges. He could be really difficult. But in the key moments, he was exactly what I needed. I was there when Jim was asking for his permission to marry my sister. And before Jim could finish asking, my dad said, the answer is yes, and I will right now give you a check for $5,000 if you elope. <laughs> and Jim said, heck yeah. And my sister said, no, I want a wedding. So it was about twice that much. <laughs> Through my mom's patient prayers, her godly example, her love, along with key people in my dad's life, the Lord Jesus saved him when he was about 35 years old. My parents were married for about 10 years before they had children, so I was only a little boy when that happened. A choir member at North College Hill Presbyterian Church here in Cincinnati invited my dad to come hear their choir. Dad heard a sermon by Pastor Jerry Kirk on forgiveness that had a deep impact on him. He told me and the love of God and Christ and the convicting work of the Holy Spirit was beginning to break through his crusted over agnostic hardened heart. The merciful God of the universe showed mercy to my dad and saved him from his sins and brought him to the cross. Mom and dad have both told me that story and others have filled in more details over the years. Dad put a a Gaither gospel album on and was apparently up all night long sobbing, weeping like a little child over his sin and weeping over joy that God had finally broken through and saved him. As I said, I was only a little boy when that happened, so I never knew my dad as anything but a Christian. And one of the great privileges of my life was hearing him preach a sermon about his conversion titled, My Agnostic Friend Now Deceased. And his agnostic friend was himself. He also preached a sermon called The Goodness Lie, where he showed from passage after passage after passage that nobody can be good enough to go to heaven. And that was what he used and pressed on me all the time when I was a kid, was that. One time, I saw a list of things he prayed for on his desk, and my name was on there. I said, Patrick, Patrick's salvation, his future wife, her salvation, his future children, their future spou spouses, their salvation. 
I want to share with you a few things, some of my dad's favorite passages of scripture and exposit some of them to you because they're precious to me because they were precious to my dad. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. I've heard this passage quoted probably more than any other passage in the Bible. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. My dad knew that I was a worrier. I took after you, Mom. Sorry about that. And he would tell me, son, prayer is demonic meditation. Or, excuse me, worrying is demonic meditation. (laughs) He did not say that. Sorry. (laughs) There's people back home praying for me. They need to pray harder. (laughs) Mm. Worry is demonic meditation. It's the opposite of trusting in the Lord. And he would say, son, I don't worry, I pray. And I sleep well because God will be up all night anyway. He said that to me over and over and over again when I was a kid. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, does indeed guard our hearts and our minds through Christ if we learn how to trust in him, if we learn how to really rely on him. I think that my dad did struggle with worrying, and that's why that passage meant so much to him and why he quoted it, and it was on his mind and heart as often as it was. He taught me to pray instead of worry. My dad also had a great zeal for evangelism. He wanted others to know the Savior who had saved him. And another passage he pressed on me all the time was John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Dad loved apologetics and evangelism. And he taught me that famous argument that Jesus had to be one of three things. He had to be either the Lord that everyone needs to believe in to be saved, or he's a liar, or he's a lunatic. Those are the only options available to us. And Jesus, throughout his entire earthly ministry, forced people to a decision. Everywhere he went, Jesus divided people. Everywhere he went, he generated hostility. And I'll tell you, the modern conception of Jesus that people have is based upon ignorance of the Bible. People don't read their Bibles anymore in this country. The average American home has four Bibles, and very few of them ever get opened and read. The modern Jesus, who doesn't exist, he just loved everybody the way they were. He accepted everybody no matter what they did, no matter what they were into. That's not the Jesus of the Bible. That's not the one we meet in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In fact, the Apostle Paul himself, who preached Christ and him crucified and planted churches throughout the Mediterranean world, was dealing with fake and phony Jesuses throughout his entire ministry. 2 Corinthians 11.4, he said that there were other Jesuses, other gospels, other spirits out there that were mimicking Christianity. And so I say to you that the, the Jesus that so many people think of today is a figment of people's imaginations. And I pray every day that God would open the eyes of our dark and deceived nation that we live in And that people would read the Bible again. And one of the greatest evangelists in modern history, the the great Charles Haddon Spurgeon, said most people that own Bibles don't read them. And those Bibles sit in their homes and there's enough dust on the front of the Bible for them to take their finger and write the word damnation on it. People despised Jesus. And that's, I'll tell you, when I was 18 and very first started reading my Bible, my parents, God bless them, they always made sure I had one. I didn't care. I didn't read it until I was 18 years old. And I remember encountering Jesus as he really is in the Bible. People hated him. They either loved him or they hated him. And Jesus called them sinners. Jesus told people the truth. He told them, if you don't repent and believe in me, you will go to hell forever. No one ever talked more about hell in the Bible than Jesus did. None of the Old Testament prophets, Moses, Isaiah, Ezekiel, no one spoke about that more than Jesus. And that's why his enemies conspired to kill him. This is why those who are his true followers today, if they're willing to speak out against the relativism, the atheism, the sexual immorality, the wickedness all around us, they can expect nothing less than the very same rejection, the very same hatred. Jesus said in John 7, verse 7, The world cannot hate you, speaking to his brothers who didn't believe in him, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. 
John 15, 18, one of the last things Jesus told his disciples before he was arrested, he made them this promise. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. My father taught me by example that our highest loyalty is to Jesus. If you're going to dare to take his name upon your mouth and say that you're one of his followers, your highest loyalty is to him. Whatever the cost, you pay it. We are to love Jesus and his truth more than our wife, more than our family, more than our children, more than money, more than popularity. And if we have to stand alone on the side of the Lord, we do it gladly. He taught me that following Jesus is not a game. It's not a sickly, sentimental, sweet thing you can do. And there will be times that people will absolutely, positively hate your guts for it. Jesus was hated because he told the world the truth. His disciples were hated. They were persecuted. They were murdered by the world because they also told people the truth. Jesus' followers today, in this godless, immoral, twisted generation that we find ourselves in in America, can expect nothing less if they're really willing to stand for God's truth and God's righteousness and the exclusivity of faith in Christ alone for salvation. That is just as unpopular today as it was when Jesus said it, when his apostles said it, and it will be for our kids and grandkids long after all of us are gone. Jesus warned his followers, if the world hates you, know it hated me before it hated you. And he told them, no servant is greater than his master. You think you can live a posh, easy life and really be one of my followers? Think again. If you're going to stand for me and my truth, you're going to have opposition. My father taught me that. Jesus was hated and persecuted. Why do so many of his professed disciples today seem to have as their goal to win the world's approval? Dad taught me you stay loyal to Christ and to the truth, whatever the cost. Dad gave me the apologetics lectures on audio cassette of the late Dr. Walter Martin. He had a whole slew of, of cassettes by Walter Martin. And I listened to those constantly on tape players once I came to Christ. And Dr. Martin pointed out the same thing that my dad did to me. You have to make a decision. Is he the Lord? Is he the only savior of sinners? Or is he lying? Or is he nuts? Is he a lunatic? If you don't bow to him as your Lord and trust in his finished work to save you from your sins and reconcile you to God, your only other options are to say, I guess he was a liar or that he was a lunatic. Jesus claimed directly to be God in the flesh. The scriptures present that to us. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In John 1.14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God became flesh. God the Son added a fully human nature to himself in the incarnation. When God spoke to Moses from the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, Moses said, who should I tell the children of Israel has sent me? Who, who sent me? He said, you tell them I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. When Jesus was arguing with his opponents, his religious Jewish opponents at the Feast of Tabernacles in John chapter 8, verse 58, he said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. He claimed to be the voice from the burning bush, God in human flesh. And the very next verse says, Then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. They knew what he was claiming. He was claiming, I am God in human flesh. Fully human, but had no human father. You see, if Jesus had had a, a, a father like I did, he would have been born in sin, just like me. That's why the virgin birth is an essential truth of the Christian faith. Someone's got to start out like the first Adam did, sinless. He's got to enter into that law that all of us have broken. He's got to keep it perfectly if any of us are going to be saved. He's got to satisfy the punishment at the cross, which he does. Fully human, fully God. Two distinct natures in one person. You either believe him or you don't. That's what my dad pushed and pushed and pushed. You've got to make a decision. What do you think about him? Who is he to you? You either trust in his cross and trust in his righteousness to save you, 
Or you've got to think that you're good enough to go to heaven. And that's why my dad preached that sermon, the goodness lie. And he went from passage to passage to passage. I remember that, that message. All the passages that were justified by faith in Christ, not by works. There is none good, no, not even one. There is none who does righteousness. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's Christ alone or we're lost. And Dad told me over and over and over again, Son, who is Jesus? Son, who is he to you? That's the key to everything. Do you believe him or not? Is he your Lord and Savior? Or do you think he's lying? Is he your Lord and Savior? Or do you think he's a lunatic? Those are the only options. He claimed to be God in human flesh, the only Savior of sinners, that anyone who died not trusting only in him and not in their good works or supposed good goodness, Jesus said, you will go to hell. You either have to believe in him or you've got to write him off as a liar or dismiss him as a lunatic. Those are the only options available to us. Dad hammered that point to me my whole life. And I used to wonder, why? Why is that such a, a big thing to him? And he would tell me, there are people who think he was just a good moral teacher. A real nice guy. Someone who set a good example for us to follow. Here's a quotation from one of my dad's favorite authors. Quote, I'm trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That's the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sorts of things Jesus said would not be a good moral teacher. He would be either a lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. End quote. Dad put that question to me from the time I could understand English until I was saved, until I was about 18. He would say, son, this, the question faces you. It's the same question that faces everyone in the world. Who do you think Jesus is? It was after high school when Jesus finally closed in, I believe, through the, his relentless prayers and my mother's relentless prayers. And I remember the thought about three months into my freshman year in college, you fooled everyone but God, Patrick. You're going to hell where you belong. And thankfully, when my parents dropped me off at that dorm room, they left a pristine, brand-new Bible on my bookshelf. Never opened it. Never looked at it. For the first time in my life, I took it off the shelf and started reading. Matthew 1, verse 1, read the New Testament. And then it became my turn to weep over how sinful and terrible I'd been throughout my life. But so very thankful, and to this day, so very thankful for the mercy, grace, and forgiveness of God and the love of a father that would not give up. Jesus' final words from the cross are still the lifeblood of my soul, as I'm sure they are for many of you. In John 19, 28, the scripture says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. And dear ones, that's why it's a fool's errand to trust in your own goodness, to trust in your own works. If we could achieve heaven by being good enough, he didn't need to do that. It's precisely because we cannot save ourselves that Jesus had to come and do everything he did. That's what his name means. We go over it every year at this time. I hope it means something more than simply a passage that we read occasionally. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. He will save them from their sins. Not help them be good enough, or help them pull it off. The great apostle Paul, what a, what a glorious conversion he had. He was a self-righteous, confident, arrogant Pharisee. 
absolutely convinced that he had earned a place for himself in heaven by how good he was. Until he saw Christ on the Damascus Road. Until he saw the holiness of God. Until he got a vision of that. This man wrote 13 letters in the New Testament, evangelized the Gentile world, devoted himself to loving the people he once wanted to murder and kill. He wrote this about his former resume. Philippians chapter 3. He basically says here, if you all think you could have gotten to heaven by being good enough, you think that you had enough good works, you think that you're pretty good people, I bet you I was better. He says, though I, I might have confidence in how good I am, if anyone else thinks that they have confidence in the flesh, in their works, I bet you I've got more. He says, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. I was as good as you could be in this world until he saw Christ. And then he wrote this. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. He said, I'm done trusting in myself. I'm done trusting in how good I am. I don't want to be found on the day of judgment with a righteousness of my own from the law, but that which comes as a free gift of God through Christ, the righteousness that is imputed to your legal account so that you're justified once and for all eternity before the judgment seat of God. And everything he once thought was so good about himself, he says, it's rubbish. It's rubbish. That Greek word skubalon means dung, excrement, useless. Paul thought he was a great person. I'm a great person. I'm salt of the earth. Really nice guy. Upright, generous, moral, godly. Certainly I'm going to heaven. Right? Wrong. When Paul saw the holiness of God and saw who God really is, everything he used to be so confident in didn't look so great anymore the ultimate testimony to human helplessness to save itself by its works is the baby Jesus laying in the manger the fact that he came he came because we can't do it that's proof nobody can get to heaven by being good enough Paul summarized it so well in Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ it is no longer I who live but Christ lives in me in the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And then he says, I do not set aside the grace of God. He says, I don't nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness comes to the law, if you could get into heaven by being good enough, Christ died in vain. If my dad could speak to you all now, I think he would want to let you know that no one is ever too far gone. No one is ever too hard-hearted or too lost. For Jesus to save them. What do I have to do to be saved? What is repentance? Repentance is grieving over, hating your sin, recognizing you've got nothing that could commend you to God. Faith in Jesus means you officially, permanently get out of the Savior business. And you rely upon what Jesus did and nothing else. Nothing else. I think my dad would also want the people here with lost loved ones that keep praying, never lose heart, and believe that all things are possible with God. And I want to close with the lyrics to a song that my dad wrote about coming to know Christ. It's called A Heart of Stone. And I used to hear him singing this, and he told me, this is my song of testimony. I, I, I wrote this, this song of testimony. And I thought that that meant every Christian had to write a song and sing it. <laughs> Thankfully, that turned out not to be true. It goes, there was a time when I was lost in sin. Jesus stood a knocking, but I would not let him in. Jesus sought to walk with me, but I made my way alone. Inside my breast there beat a heart of stone. There was a time when I was quite a fool. Satan was a friend of mine because I was his willing tool. I closed my ears and shut my eyes and stumbled all alone. 
Inside my breast there beat a heart of stone. But Jesus took my stony heart and threw it far away. He replaced it with a better one that grand and glorious day. The heart that he put into me was fashioned from his own, and now inside there's love instead of stone. There was a time when I was all there was. My whole world revolved around of me and mine because I was king, yes, I was Lord. Myself was on the throne. Inside my breast there beat a heart of stone. But Jesus took my stony heart and threw it far away. He replaced it with a better one that grand and glorious day. The heart that he put into me was fashioned from his own, and now inside there's love instead of stone. There will be a time when we shall see his face, when all those purchased by the cross will finally take their place. We'll form the singing multitude there in our heavenly home, even I, who once possessed a heart of stone. Because Jesus took my stony heart and threw it far away, he replaced it with a better one that grand and glorious day. The heart that he put into me was fashioned from his own, and now inside there's love instead of stone. Deep down inside there's love instead of stone. There is faith and hope and love instead of stone. Let's pray. Gracious Lord and God, I thank you for your saving mercy. My dad's life, thank you for the people that loved him, who taught him the gospel, and thank you for my mother's love for his soul, for her godly example during those difficult times, loving him to the cross. And I thank you for convicting my dad of his sin, showing him that there's no hope in ourselves, and drawing him to our Savior's feet. Father, I pray that you would carry us through the grieving process. It's such a blessing to me to know my father died in faith. He died trusting in the finished work of Jesus. And that with him, those that know Christ will form that singing multitude in our heavenly home. Even all of us who are born again once had hearts of stone ourselves. Lord, bless the rest of our service and our singing. May Christ and his righteousness be magnified and glorified in it. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.